sharing. Okay, can everybody, everybody can see my screen, I assume. Yep. Um, so, hi, thanks for giving me the opportunity to do this. Well, I have to say this was your idea and this original, original idea that uh, you came up with. So uh, and you deserve all credit, so please. Uh, so <clears throat> basically, so my name is Matt Marine. I'm a, a student here at Lehigh, Master's of Financial Engineering Program. Um, I decided to investigate as part of my capstone project covered interest rate parity in the cryptocurrency market. And I really have three goals in mind. Um, the first goal is to do a basically a simple test on the covered interest rate parity condition um, by measuring the deviation across various cryptocurrencies. Uh, secondary goal is to examine whether an effective trading strategy can be created. And then uh, thirdly, I wanted to see if there's information contained in the yields of the cryptocurrencies that could potentially have applications and things like portfolio management or, um, um, you know, beating a benchmark investing. Um, so essentially I'm testing whether or not this parity condition is zero and I'll, I'll get to what the, the actual like formula for the parity condition is. But the first kind of question I had asked myself is, um, you know, why, why would I even think this is true? Um, in, it, in the first place. And the, the main reason that I think that this, this parity condition will be violated is primarily because cryptocurrency markets are so fragmented. Um, and what, what do I mean by fragmented? So a, a big one is there's different regulatory regimes that govern the cryptocurrency space. So like an example of this is in the US, um, cryptocurrency is governed by the CFTC it's seen as a commodity. It's not the case all over the world. Um, but for example, even when I was looking at futures or forward contracts to trade, uh, to test this condition, you know, I, I looked at the CME and I quickly realized that it's probably not the product simply because it doesn't even trade continuously and cryptocurrency markets run continuously. Um, there's different exchanges that have different rules and different product offerings. So, for instance, um, I used a weekly contract. It was the only exchange that has weekly contracts is OKEx. Most other exchanges have monthly uh, or quarterlies. OKEx has weekly, biweekly, quarterlies. Um, the, the, a big one is that the lending market is, I called it nascent. It's basically, there's, there's not a clear yield curve for any specific currency. And so that's kind of a necessary condition. Um, in my opinion, to have a parity, have a covered interest rate parity hold. Uh, and, you know, there's just the lending market is growing and changing from a technology perspective. Um, as new cryptocurrencies enter the space, it's also, um, you know, there's like on Bitfinex, for instance, which is the exchange I use to pull the, the actual lending data, it actually has a limit order book. And so there's there's just a lot of variation there. And there's very few uh, real like term lending where, you know, you, you would set say a month, a month loan or something like that. Um, I'm, I, just cause I know I only have 15 minutes, I'm gonna try and try and kind of get to some of the, the meteor stuff here. Um, so this is just a, a slide showing the, the, uh, the formula itself. Um, I thought an interesting quote when I was just kind of studying this was that this is the closest thing to a physical law in international finance. Um, and that's that's true, you know, they've, they've done studies where they've looked at millions of transactions and seen zero arbitrage opportunities or fractional pennies of an arbitrage opportunity that gets whisked away rather quickly. Um, well, let me, let me just mention briefly what it is. Uh, so it's essentially a, a, the no arbitrage condition that governs the futures price of a of a, of a contract uh, relative to the spot price and the interest rate differential of each currency. And so this formula can be approximated using natural logarithms as this formula. And this is kind of what I use to actually do the, the sort of test, if you will. 
Um, and if you look at the left side, that's called the basis. So this is really the difference between the forward and the spot price. And the right side is called the um, differential, interest rate differential in the, uh, the, um, the currencies. Um, so because the, the lending market is, uh, you know, there's no real yield curve, what I, I did is I used the method um, from a paper written by um, Carl Franz and um, Alexander Valentin, and I scaled uh, the right-hand side. I scaled the differential to match the tenor of the futures contracts. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I pulled the futures di contract data from OKEX. Um, I used the weekly expiry, and I took investment and borrow rates from Bitfinex, uh, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Um, it, so to me, uh, I, I'd say a picture is kind of worth a thousand words. Um, so, so, yeah, so in this slide, I mean, you could kind of see uh, I broke out the parity, um, parity differential which is essentially just the, the sum of the, the difference between the left and the right side of that equation. Um, and I, but I broke it out into the left and the right hand side of the equation. And you can, you can just see it, kind of what's going on here. Uh, these are just two currencies, but it's pretty, pretty, pretty consistent across all of the currencies that this is kind of the pattern you saw, you see when you, when you look at this or have seen where the blue lines are the basis. So the blue lines are the left side, the orange lines are the right side. And you can see that the right side's kind of dragging the left side towards zero, but um, there was a big, a brief kind of six month period where the actual um, basis was extremely high, <laughs> extremely large, you know? And so when I was doing this research, I was about here. I was in like uh, end of June, early July. And so there was some hope in my heart that this would kind of like come back and the, the trade would uncrowd, but it seems to have kind of crowded out. So uh, I'm going to, so briefly, I mean, these are just summary statistics. Um, Matthew, hold on before you go further. So basically there was an opportunity then. When you it it looks like it yeah. in my back, in my, it was just, just looking at this. I mean, it doesn't take it, take a, you know, a, a rocket scientist to figure out. Yeah. There was some, definitely some, probably some opportunity for, for, for a, quite a, you know, a big enough period of time to take advantage of it. It seems to have crowded out. That trade seems to have gone away, essentially. I have some theories on it. I, I don't know that I'll have time to cover um, everything because I have a lot of slides. So. Um, so this is basically a, uh, a summary statistics slide of, uh, there's a seven currency pairs here. <laughs> um, that shows, yeah, in this period, okay, you, there's definitely some statistical difference um, one thing to consider, uh, you know, you're saying about one to 3%, most of it's in that one period. One thing that really needs to be considered though is transaction cost round trip transaction costs for around 30 basis points for this trade. So it's, you know, it, it economically it's when you look back at this slide and that whole right side is basically useless. You can't really use it, um, because it's, it's, to not something you can really take advantage of in the real world. Um, so, you know, I, I looked at um, essentially creating a theoretical trading strategy first, uh, which would be to, to bar, uh, when you see this parity deviation, essentially you can borrow US dollars, you'd sell forward, you'd buy the spot, you then invest the, the base currency, um, and then unwind the trade. That would be like the typical covered interest rate parity trade uh, to take advantage of the, the no arbitrage condition. That's something you could do in a like a liquid financial market if you're a big institution, probably not as a retail investor. Um, but I took a little more practical approach because I, I didn't want to hold collateral at two exchanges um, of essentially just trading the left side. So essentially just trading the basis because that's where almost all of the deviation was coming from. Um, and I ran the strategy, uh, I back-tested the strategy uh, using a 5% deviation threshold for various currencies. And this is kind of the past the panel of re returns um, 
in running that strategy at a 5% threshold through that, through that period. And some of it's okay. It's not great. And this is net of transaction costs. And this is a lagged signal. So I made the trade the next, it's hourly data, made the trade after, after I received the signal um, in the next period. Um, and the, you know, the, the takeaway for me is that there's def- there was definitely something here, at least for some of these currencies, even after transaction costs. I mean, I, I would take a, 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 you know, 15% return on essentially a market neutral trade any day of the week. So um, this is kind of a representative of what the strategies tend to look like during this period. And as you can clearly see, pretty much all of the action is in that one period. And then it looks like the trade got crowded out. Um, as mentioned, I was probably in early July when I thought about this and started developing an algorithm to trade it. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've developed, I actually have developed the algorithm. I actually deployed it on what on a, uh, a web service and, um, we're kind of on the right hand side of this. So there's really, the signal's kind of dead. Um, Here's the algorithm workflow that I used. Uh, uh, just a shout out to Gaurav Singh, who's my corporate sponsor here, who helped me develop, who kind of gave me a, a roadmap for this um, a workflow. I'm not, I'm not really going to go too far into the weeds on it just because, um, well, well, mainly, mainly because of time constraints, but the big picture, I, I'm pulling data from two exchanges, feeding it into a signal, running that through a risk management system. It tells me, you know, it asks, do I have positions? Am I at my max position limit on this? Uh, you know, do you want, should I buy or sell? It outputs an order to an order management system, executes at the brokers, goes into a trade book, which goes into an order book to manage the p and goes into a performance. It's all governed kind of by this configuration file. So I really wanted to get to this, uh, which I, th- I found interesting. Um, so after kind of running through this and realizing that, you know, this has, it seems to be a crowded trade, I decided to kind of shift a little bit into the relationship between yields and returns and question their persistence and predictive predictability. Um, so kind of top level, um, this is a, a box plot of funding rates for a basket of, of currencies. Um, these are funding rates pulled from OPEX. This is in, in 2021. And what they tend to exhibit is sort of bouts of scarcity. That's why you get these sort of strange looking plots where there's certain times where like the demand to um, borrow these currencies spikes and the rates go through the roof. Um, so the natural question that I asked is kind of how do lending rates relate to returns? Um, and so here's a scatter plot. Um, it looks like I have a couple minutes. So I'm gonna try and speed through this a little bit. You can see they kind of posit- po- uh, you know, correlate positively, but not super significantly so. Um, so essentially I, I used this method and I looked at a, at a basket and I tried to separate it. Um, this is not an investable strategy yet, but it will be. And so, that kind of middle line is sort of the average of the bas- of an equally weighted basket rebalancing uh, daily visits, daily frequency. And if you look at, there's a, some actual separation when you separate the baskets into high and low yield, which told me there may be something, you know. Um, I then checked for persistency. Uh, so if there's some type of predict, some type of separation, and the yields are persistently persistent from one period to another then that, that indicates there could be something there that you might be able to trade. And I see for, you can see from the, the partial um, autocorrelations that there seems to be consistency for most of them, at least through a, a lag or two. Um, I conducted an independent double sort. This kind of gave me some inconclusive results. So I'm just gonna go to the, the conditional sort. So when I conditionally sort on, well, I'm sorry, but if I could back up just for a moment, the question that I then asked myself was, well, maybe our returns related to say market cap, you know, maybe low yield returns are a function of market cap. So I did a conditional sort. Um, and it turns out when you condition on market cap, you get an increase in returns 
when you separate the baskets by low and high yield. And I'm conditioning on lagged market cap and lagged yield. So this is actually an investable strategy. And you can see, you kind of get what you want. From low to high, you get an increase on high market cap. From low to high, you get an increase in returns on low market cap. Um, I then conducted a Fama and Macbeth uh, pooled regression just to uh, check on the T stats and make sure that, and look to see if there's anything, you know, real significant about them um, to, to see if there's like, a, if this is a good investment decision to make based on, based on the yields. It's a little inconclusive, to be honest. I didn't get real significant T stats on the lagged rate, but it is positive. It is in the right direction. So I guess the big, you know, kind of takeaway is it probably needs some more investigation before I would recommend that as an investing investment strategy. Um, just to conclude, I examined the covered interest rate parity condition in the crypto market, and it was statistically significant, uh, but not economically significant after June. An effective strategy can be constructed. However, the trade seems to be crowded out and yields do seem to have some impact on future returns of cryptocurrencies, even when controlling for market cap, although not significantly so. And I'm about a minute over, but... Uh, That's okay. Uh, <laughs> let me let me check there because I think uh, Metzala is supposed to go on, but he may have some technical issues, so you may have time to spend a bit more time. Okay, I mean, if there are questions or any? Uh, not right now. I think people are just, you know, wondering, okay, um, this is a lot of information. Hold on. Someone says, very interesting finding and research. Oh, Gaurav says, great project. Thank you. <laughs> I guess he's, 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 uh, he's, he's looking at what's going on here from uh, his new job. Uh, but said, are you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Professor. Okay, you're ready? Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Okay. Right. So we have uh, okay. someone. That, okay, thanks. I'm going to stop. Thank you, everybody. Okay.